Shalom, shalom, giving honor and praise to the creator and to the maker of heaven and earth. This subject matter right here is a kind of a controversial one, but it's a necessary one for edification purposes. It is a response to many brothers and sisters who are Israelites from a brother who is what you might consider or some might consider quote unquote non-messianic. Let's first understand that the terms messianic and non-messianic is not founded within the scriptures what bothers the mind of many people who are referred to as non-messianic is the fact that they can sit there and present a case such as saying thus say if yah thus say if the lord god said and then people will still come and ask the person who they call non-messianic but what was the voice what was the angel what was the arm what was in the cloud it's amazing to the mind of a brother or a sister who is considered to be non-messianic. Why are you asking a question about who or what or what is or what was when the Most High is, was, and will be? So let that be noted and understood. At the end, all having been heard, fear the Most High and keep his commandments. That's in Ecclesiastes. So whoever one might feel and say and understand who they say a Messiah is, that was never even a big argument or pinnacle within the nation of Israel. So let's also understand something from an Israelite stance of point. Israel is the anointed of the Most High. When you go in the book of Psalms, chapter 105. Let's go there. We go to the book of Tehillim or Psalms 105. So that way we can gain some understanding concerning this kind of matter. Psalms or Tehillim 105. We're going to start in verse... 12. When they, speaking of Israel, when they were but a few men in number, yea, very few and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he, the Most High, verse 14, he suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Now, for those familiar with the Hebrew, it says, touch not my anointed. The Hebrew word that's used there is the Hebrew word, Meshikai. Meshikai means my anointed ones. That's the pluralization of it. So that's talking about Israel being the anointed of the Most High. It says, touch not my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. So if the brother that we read of in the New Testament, as they say is Yahoshua, some say Yahawashai, some say Yahshua, if he was both Messiah, anointed and prophet, how then was it right for him to be touched and harmed? How was that the sacrifice for Israel when the people were told, the other nations regarding Israel's anointing, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm? So it's never been the custom in the Hebrew way of life to have a person who's a prophet and or anointed to be harmed up, beat up, so forth and so on, and then say that was the sacrifice for the people. No, that's not the culture of Israel as being presented. So this is not to sound harsh, offensive, disrespectful, or anything of that sort. Just want to cover a couple of issues right here. Nowhere in one of the famous chapters that many of the brothers and sisters, some of them are my loved ones and everything of that sort, Quote, such as Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Nowhere in Isaiah chapter 53 does it say that one in Isaiah 53 was anointed. Nowhere in there does it say that. Mashiach in Hebrew means anointed one. Mashikai means my anointed ones. Mishiki means my anointed one. It comes from the Hebrew root word mashak, which means to anoint. Aaron was anointed. Solomon was anointed. Yehu was anointed. Hazael was anointed. Itamar was anointed. David was anointed. There are many, many people in the Hebrew scriptures that were anointed. Now, this is not a bash on any particular school or any particular camp or anything of that sort. It's a response to our brothers and sisters who are Israelites concerning teachings that they say that old testament brothers don't understand supposedly let's go if we will to isaiah chapter 40 verse 1 comfort ye comfort ye my people saith your god speak ye comfortably to jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished 
that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hands double for all her sins. Now, one of the things to let it be noted and understood is you have to understand time and place. Isaiah, let's go in the beginning of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, so we can gain an understanding concerning this kind of matter. We are in the scriptures. Isaiah 1, 1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Uzziah, Jotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So just wanted to sit there and make this point be noted right here. That Isaiah was prophesying and speaking to people at a particular time. Yes, there are prophecies in there that have not come to pass yet. And there are certain prophecies that have a dual connotation. Such as in that particular time as well as in the future that we have yet to see. However, in this particular one right here, he is speaking in reference with the people of Hezekiah because you got to understand in chapter 39 it speaks about how Hezekiah was sick and that how he was given um extra days along in his life and if you understand the history of what happened with the nation of Israel Hezekiah when you go to in the book of um second chronicle pardon me first chronicles chapter 30 pardon me second chronicles chapter 30 you sit there and you see know and understand that he had people from different tribes of israel come to jerusalem to keep the passover bear that in mind as we go into part two concerning this all right it says comfort ye comfort ye my people say it's your god now comfort ye the most high is telling the people to comfort themselves don't be so excited calm down comfort ye be at peace be at still that's what it's talking about. It is not talking about a person. When it says comfort ye, it is not saying that a comforter is going to come. It is telling the people in the command form to be relaxed and to calm down. All right. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished and that her iniquity is pardoned. For she have received of the Lord's hands double for all her sins. Now, to the brothers and sisters who are saying that. Yahshua or who they call Jesus in the New Testament was through his blood was the pardon of sins. How then do we explain this portion right here? Because you don't read nowhere about the blood of any man atoning for the sins of Israel. Yet we see right here in the scriptures, it says that iniquity is pardoned. Keep your hand there and let's go, if you will, to the book of Isaiah. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 44, if you will. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou should not be forgotten of me. I, meaning the Most High, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So who is the Redeemer? The Redeemer is the Most High. So let that be noted and understood. So if Israel is redeemed, it's by the Most High. If Israel is saved, it's by the Most High. And just for edification purposes, when you go, brothers and sisters, in your own time, and you read in Numbers, the 20th chapter, where Moses said, shall we bring forth water from the rock? The Most High said to him, wherefore have you not sanctified me in the midst of the children of Israel? See, the people, when you go in Numbers chapter 20, it talks about the what is a Meribah or the what is a strife. The people were saying, we want water, we want water, we want water. And so Moshe or Moses, when he struck the rock, prior to him striking the, striking the rock and water coming out, he said, shall we bring forth water? And the Most High said to him, because you did not sanctify me, Yah, in the midst of the children of Israel, therefore ye, Moses, shall not go into the land that I promised unto the children of Israel. So what's being stated, like when you go in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, he says, I am Yah, that is my name, my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So this is not an attack on any school or any camp. I'm not going to try to blow up anybody's name because that's not what we're about as Israelites, understand? So, like some other brothers and sisters do, which is incorrect. But one of the things to let it be noted, like we were just discussing, in the situation that happened with the prophet Moshe or Moses, the most I said, you have not sanctified me. Sanctify means to make holy. Holy means to make sanctified. That means to make separate. Moshe or Moses did not sanctify the Most High in the midst of the children of Israel. How? That was done by saying, shall we bring forth water as if it's the Most High and Moses. It's not. It's the Most High, period. 
Zehu. Sof who? That's it. That's the end. So it's not the most high and. So let that be noted and understood. So even though, yes, the most high uses men, brothers and sisters, the most high said he gives you a king in his anger and take him away in his wrath. The most high said in Isaiah, wherefore should you be mindful of man who has the breath of life? Just, he's a man like you're a man. Yes, you pay homage and yes, you pay respect to your elders. Yes, you honor your father and you honor your mother. Yes, you love your brother, the brothers and the sisters and so forth and so on. But um, to be quite truthful and honest of the matter, it's the most high who gets the glory. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of Yah shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Yah has spoken it. Now, there's a teaching going around saying that when it says, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God, that is speaking about John the Baptist within the New Testament. Now, not knocking any brother or sister, if that is the case, Israel, then why is it that every valley is not exalted and every mountain and hill is not made low in this day and time? If Isaiah chapter 40 verse 4 and 5 is talking about the timing of Yochanan and Yahshua or John and Yahshua, if that's the case, then why was it not fulfilled in that day and time? Every valley has not been made low. Every mountain has not been made low. We're still in a confusing state. The glory of the Most High has not been revealed unto us yet. So let that be noted and understood. As a matter of fact, when you go into the New Testament, brothers and sisters, Yahshua is recorded when you go to Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 21 where he distinctly and emphatically says when the enemy comes flee from Jerusalem because and then later on you see that the people when Luke was saying oh we thought of him as the redeemer they always Israel always wanted somebody to be that Mashiach or to be that person that was going to be sent to do a particular mission but when he is saying in the New Testament when the enemy comes flee he is letting you know, I go to be with my father. I'm not the one that you made me out to be. And there are certain portions in the New Testament that actually get into that kind of subject matter. For instance, when you go into the book of Mark, when it says, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he says, why you call me good? There's only one, there's no one good but one, that's God. So why then do people ask people who they call, quote unquote, non-messianics, why do we only speak about the Father mainly? Why do we only pray in the name of the Father only? But then at the same token, you're trying to bring a person to us that said that he is not greater than his Father. So if that's the case, then why do you keep on coming in the name of that same one? For instance, there are many brothers and sisters who are messianic. And they will say emphatically that the New Testament always refers you to the Old Testament. So here's my question, and I say this in love to my brothers and sisters. If the New Testament constantly, as brothers and sisters state, refer you to the Old Testament, then why are you staying in the New Testament? If I'm reading a book, and this book says turn to page 90, I'm not going to stay on page 100. I'm going to go back to page 90 to see what, why is this referring to this. That's very important to let it be noted and understood. So... Once it comes right down to it, after all having been heard, fear the Most High, keep His commandments. Because that's the whole duty of man. Now, to get back very briefly, because there's going to be a part two. Is that concerning the arm of the Most High. Because there's somebody or there's brothers and sisters teaching that the arm of the Most High is who they call Yahshua. Or who they refer to as Jesus at times. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 2. It says this. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Most High, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. So let's go, if you will, from here into the book of Exodus chapter. So that way we can gain some understanding. We are going to go in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, so we can gain an understanding concerning this kind of matter. And we read as follows. 
Wherefore say unto Yisrael, I am Yah, and I will bring you from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will rid you of their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. So the arm was already shown to Israel when he was bringing them out of Egypt, and that arm was not of flesh.